first of all, any questions, comments, curiosities related to what we have discussed? I've talked a lot about correlation and other different forms of correlation. And the, the whole point of, of doing many bodies really to get this extra little piece of energy. And uh, hopefully it, it's coming across. If you have any questions, please let me know or stop me at any time. So I'm gonna keep going. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, you can get pretty reasonable accuracy just with a single Slater determinant. But of course this is not perfect, especially in the G2 set. The, the accuracy is, is, is still, you know, several K calls per mole, but we, we really want to get this better. How do we do this? So in this case, we use the simplest possible wave function that, that we can use. This is the what's called best practice, as I already mentioned. So you, you stick to Slater a single Slater determinant and a gesture. Uh, to get better results, of course, the answer is always going to be improve your wave function. So if you want better than three to four K call, use something more than a single Slater determinant or change the Slater determinant completely. The gesture part, we kind of exhaust to some degree. So the, 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 the optimization and the variations of the gesture are a lot simpler to do in principle because they are, uh, they, they, you don't get any anti-symmetry, so the evaluation is a lot quicker. So in a sense, we always kind of exhaust what we can do with the gastro pretty easily. The real challenge is to improve the anti-symmetric piece, which is where all the quantumness, the exchange piece. And it's what defines completely the fixed node error. If you remember yesterday, David was talking about fixed node. This is the idea that in the real, the real diffusion is a bosonic process. So you have to take this fermionic problem that has both positive and negative areas and turn it into a, into a bosonic problem somehow where you only have positive signs. So if you make a guess ab about where the location of these nodes are, you can actually solve within these nodes and turn it into a, a bosonic problem where there are no negative signs. This, of course, is an approximation. Uh, we don't know where the real nodes are. The best we can do is guess. And the solution gets better and better the closer we get to the true nodes. So all the nodal information is completely encapsulated into the anti-symmetric piece, which is why this is by far the most important. Uh, so the simplest thing that you can do is uh, in my mind, follow quantum chemistry. So what would a quantum chemist would do? You actually expand, in, in, instead of having one determinant, you can do a linear combination of determinants. Like, and, and I, I apologize, I did not put a slide like that, I should have, but if you think about the number of determinants that you have in a, in a quantum chemistry calculation, it's a, it's a combinatorial number, it's an astronomically large number for real systems. So, for example, if you were to do a full CI calculation of a carbon dimer, on a triple zeta basis set. A triple zeta basis set has 60 basis functions. So the full CI dimension is something like 10 to the nine determinants. Uh, if you were to do something like four first row atoms on a double zeta basis set, the number of determinants is something like 10 to the 19. So it's really something that we cannot even envision. We cannot even store something like that big in, in a system. In practice, we don't need to. Uh, but in principle, we know that there's a, a systematic route to getting closer to the real answer, just put more determinants in. Uh, so we can do exactly the same in QMC. The, as we will see, the reason for all of these determinants is really to capture this dynamic correlation that we are already putting on the gesture. So all we are really doing is adding variation of freedom to the anti-symmetric piece so that we can recover it back with, uh, with the variational optimization. So I tend to, to see multi-determinants wave functions not as trying to reproduce a CI expansion, but as a source of variation of freedom, basically. And the better the determinant is, the more that determinant is going to contribute to the full wave function and the better the, the answer will be. So if you think about it, out of the 10 to the 19 determinants that I would need for a four atom calculation, a few thousand in QMC are enough to really get me almost the exact solution because the remaining 10 to the 19 minus 1,000 is really being captured by the gesture. The, the gesture factor takes into account cusps directly, and most of the dynamic correlation, actually. So this is the form. This is the most general form. Yes? How did you come up with 10 to the power 19? Uh, so that's just, I believe, I did this once. So I'm. Uh, no, no. Even a rough sketch so it's like, uh, how many electrons? So it's like 16 electrons in 120 orbitals, something like that. So the combinatorial number. So this is a combinatorial number, it's m in n, so you can go into like mathematics and calculate it. And, uh, and in the full CI community, this is typically reported, but uh, yeah. And uh, 
So the, the most general expansion is, of course, you always stick the just row somewhere in there, uh, but this would now become your anti-symmetric piece. So before, we would only have one of these terms. Now we have a full linear combination of this. Uh, just to make sure, the just row term there is uh, J of R, R to be pretty handsome. So the R is full three n dimensional. But so the notation that I tried to follow, and, and, and I apologize if I didn't, if there are no indexes, it's the full three n dimensional vector. Uh, if there is an index, it means the three, end, the three coordinates for the particular atom. And if you have up and down, it means only the, the up electrons and only the down electrons. Uh, so the, you can see that I write it as, as more general than it should be. In principle, let, let's say that you forget about the first sum. The, this uh, would be enough. So uh, you, you just add linear combinations of products of determinants. So the, 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 this particular way reflects the fact, and this is following quantum chemistry, that you can actually make linear combination of determinants that satisfy uh, symmetries of the system. This is called a configuration state function. And you can show that, uh, all, so in the case of a configuration state function, all these, t determ all these t coefficients are completely defined by symmetry. The simplest way to see what a configuration state function is doing is, if you have a wave function that's uh, for, a singlet, for a singlet state, for example, uh, to have, you, you, don't, you have a, an, an even number of electrons, and there is no spin polarization. Up and down is exactly the same. So if you have a certain determinant that has a particular electron in, a, in, an, in an orbital up and a down electron in a different orbital down, you need to have the exact de determinant contribution but with opposite uh, occupations to exactly keep everything even. So if you think about it, even if you were to do the full CI regardless of symmetry, in the exact solution, these two determinants would need to have exactly the same coefficient. There is no way around it because otherwise you would break spin symmetry. So what you do is, in you before you do the calculation, you assign the same coefficient to them both, and then you you'd sort of normalize the expansion so that these guys would be normalized. So for any double excitation where the, o the electrons go into different orbitals, you will always have the, the down up and the up down contribution with exactly the same coefficient, and the, coefficient will be, and the expansion coefficient will be one over the square root of two, for example. You can do the same exercise for any excitation. If you have four electrons, you're gonna have four, either four or six terms, depending exactly how you write it, in such a way that you get all possible ways of distributing the electrons that are excited in such a way that all contributions exactly are equal. So this is the, the, the concept of a configuration state function. It's a way of preserving space and spin symmetry in slated determinant contributions. And the reason why this is important is because you minimize quite significantly the number of uh, free parameters in the system and it makes the optimization a lot simpler. And I. Uh, I would go back to this, but for example, if you work with configuration state functions and you use, uh, let's say, a hundred of these, uh, the number of determinants would be actually thousands. But you only get a hundred variation of parameters to optimize, which makes things a, a lot easier. And then what you do is you make a linear combination of these configuration state functions and you include as many as you want. Uh, of course, the difficulty, there, there are difficulties in doing this in the sense that if you want to get the best answer, and I will come back to this, you have to choose what orbitals you build the determinants from. And when you're doing the calculation, this is the needle in the haystack problem. You have, like I said, 10 to the 19 determinants. So how do you choose a thousand out of 10 to the 19? And this is, I, I will come back to this. How you choose the few determinants that you want uh, or the few determinants th that would contribute out of this impossibly large number and which orbitals you use to build it. Uh, we would work on this on, on, the, on the tutorial and I will come back to this soon. So, uh, like I said, uh, all of these coefficients get optimized directly with the optimization method like I mentioned yesterday. Uh, it, it works pretty well. I mean, there's some complications when you want to system, when, when you want to optimize uh, tri uh, three body terms and linear coefficients together, but the code actually can take care of it. It just, it would be a, a little bit slower, but it would still work. Uh, like I alluded to uh, a, few, a few minutes ago, there is a limited applicability for extended systems. Uh, this is, uh, it, this hasn't, be, hasn't been shown actually, so the, uh, I would say in multi-determinant wave functions in QMC, the, the, the research is really going into how to bring this over from chemistry to solids. This is where we spend uh, most of my, our brain time on, and we, we, we have some ideas, but no one has really taken that jump yet. And the idea is that if you, if you think about it, like I mentioned, the canonical picture in quantum chemistry is that configuration interaction is irrelevant in solids. The actual fraction of any truncated CI of the correlation energy that you get is, is gonna be ex basically zero uh, or extremely small. So in QMC, this is not quite the same. 
Because in QMC, like I said, you can see the configurations as contributing variation of freedom. You don't have to see them as recovering correlation necessarily. So it's entirely possible to add determinants to a QMC wave function and, and, and get a completely different result, meaning compared to the quantum chemistry picture of adding determinants in a solid. It's if, if you have, for example, a localized region in space, some defect in a solid, you can add determinants that are localized to this regime, to this region, and you can actually get a big improvement in the energy. Anything that's localized, we can definitely do with, uh, uh, with multi-determinants. Uh, we haven't quite figured out how to do this systematically in such a way that you can go and present it and, and let it go, but we're working on this and hopefully next year, we, in a few years, we, we will be there. Uh, but in principle, it's much more challenging to do in extended systems. Uh, in, in molecules, it's very straightforward, like I will show. So the just throw already recovers most of the dynamic correlation. The whole point of the multi-determinant, if you have a very uh, strongly correlated system and you have a handful of determinants that are important, at the minimum, this is, this is what you should include. So if you're doing a molecule or a solid, let's say that has multi-reference character where you have m many reference and they're all important, the minimum you should do is include them all in your multi-determinant. But if you go beyond this, again, you don't only include uh, static correlation, but you can actually recover some of the dynamical correlation back into the, into the wave function. So typically it's very important to optimize everything together at the very last step, or actually you can do it from, from the beginning, but it's important to optimize all the variation of parameters. If you take a just throw from a single determinant calculation, and you try to stick it on a multi-determinant wave function, you are double counting correlation because the just throw accounts for some of the correlation that the multi-determinants are already capturing, and this is a problem. The other thing is that if you get coefficients that are generated from a ca quantum chemistry calculation that has no just throw, and you just stick a just throw without optimizing these coefficients, the energy would probably get worse as you include more determinants. Again, you're double counting correlation. So you're making the wave function worse by sticking a Jastro that's competing with what your wave function is doing. So the very few first few papers using multi-determinants, and of course not all of them, but there were many of these papers, uh, early, late 90s and early 2000s, where they just tried to take a wave function straight from chemistry and stick a Jastro and the energy would get worse. So for a long time there was a pessimistic view on the use of multi-determinants because they were not optimizing the coefficients, but with the development of powerful optimization techniques, mainly by people like Cyrus and Sandro so Cyrus Unrigar and Sandro Sorella, they were able to show that yes, all this variation of freedom can be extracted back. It's just a matter of having a method, an optimization method that can actually do it. So at the end of the day, the just throw will be quite dependent on, on, the, on what configurations you put in. So you have to effectively optimize everything. So the challenge is really on how robust your optimization method is. Uh, so the basic algorithm, uh, it's a little bit of math, and uh, this is what actually is going on inside the code. Uh, so for the local energy, like I said, we have to calculate three pieces. We have to calculate the wave function, the, the gradient, and the Laplacian. In this case, I, I'm using this notation where A is, is the anti-symmetric piece. Of course, there's going to be a Jastro contribution that also has to be added up. In principle, this is extremely easy. So you have a, a linear combination of products of determinants. So what you have to do is, uh, effectively, you end up with something like this, where you take first the determinant, the derivative of the first, and sec second, the derivative of the second one and you get the two terms. If you multiply and divide by the determinant, for example, you can turn it back into the, deri into the gradient of the logarithm and preserve the original uh, measure, I would say, of the, of the expansion. So if you want to do the second derivative, you get an extra term, but effectively it goes along the same lines. Uh, it's, it's particularly simple to write it down. It's just uh, the same, uh, so I, yeah, I think in this case I went from C, D to, to just combining the two terms, uh, but effectively you can do something like this. So and also realize that if you write it in terms of configuration state functions, then the, the only derivative that, the, this is the only free parameter because these are fixed, the derivative with respect to any of these parameters just gives you back specifically the, the particular configuration state function that you're talking about. So, so for VMC optimization, taking the derivative with these parameters is actually particularly simple. So the traditional algorithm, how, how you would do this a few years ago, we, I would talk about the better way of doing this, but the, the, the typical way you would do this a few years ago is you make a list of which determinants you want. So like I said, we do single particle updates to the inverse of the determinants. So if you have n determinants, you would have to have n inverses, and every time you make a one particle, uh, you move one electron, you have to update the inverse of all of these determinants. Then you would have to calculate the new determinants and the new gradients. 
and the gradients would be this piece and, uh, and then the second derivatives, which are identical to their single determinant form. It's just the orbitals that go into the determinant are different. But you have to have a list of n of these, and you would have to do whatever you're doing for one determinant. You would I basically loop through all the determinants and do this for all of them. So the cost of evaluating a multi-determinant wave function in that case would scale linearly with the number of determinants. If you have two, then you do twice the work. Uh, this, of course, uh, would make the calculation quite expensive. If you want to do a thousand determinants, you don't want to pay a factor of a thousand in the most expensive part of the of the calculation. Uh, actually, it's not the most expensive, but in a significant part of the calculation. So we recently realized, and, and this is work uh, started, and basically the idea was between Brian and, and myself, is you can actually have a, a fast algorithm to do this. Uh, you can use, the way you prove that, that, that you can use single particle updates in a, in a linear order, if you know the inverse, is using the matrix determinant lemma. So this tells you that the ratio of two determinants that only differ by a single column or a single row uh, is just the, the inner product. Actually, this is the inverse, I apologize. This is A inverse. It's just a contraction of A inverse. So the way you build a single particle or a single co row update, it would be for this guy, for example, to be zero and just one at the column where you want to make the, the change. And then this guy would be the, the new column, the change in the columns, actually. And then you can show that this is just a simple order n contraction of this matrix with, the, with this change in the, in the orbitals. So whenever you make a single particle update, to get the, the ratio of the new determinant to the old one, you, you only need to do this construction. If you can generalize this, actually, and use, there are many, many names for, for this. I call it generalized matrix determinant, but it has seems some, and anyway, so th there's many f names for this in, 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 in the linear algebra uh, community. But basically, you can generalize this to be, instead of just a single update, you can have as many updates as you want. And the only difference is that now these guys are matrices, so you can build out of this product of matrices changes to specific rows in your determinant, for example, in your uh, slated matrix. And you can show down that the ratio of two determinants is not just an inner product, but it's the determinant of inner products. So what we, what we do now in the code is, is the following. So typically, uh, you have a set of single particle orbitals, and you build determinants by choosing single particle, by choosing n of these single particle orbitals. The, uh, w first of all, we choose, a, like always, a, the Hartree-Fock as the reference, typically, but it can be anything. It's completely general. And uh, you, def you, uh, you define all of the rest of the determinants as excitations out of the single uh, of the Hartree-Fock. And you can show that the determinant, so this determinant that's right here, the matrix that you have to take the determinant from depends only on how many excitations out of your reference you get. So the ratio of the hard to fuck determinant to the new excited determinant would, would be something like this. For a, for a case of, of double excitations, let's say, where we take two of the orbitals from above and we substitute two of the orbitals from the hard to fuck state, the only thing that we need to calculate is the overlap between the, the, these, two, the, the these two orbitals, and we would do a determinant of a two by two matrix. So with, with the cost of a determinant of a two by two, we can get the ratio of a double excited determinant with respect to the Hartree-Fock determinant. So in practice, what we do is we make a list of all of our determinants, and we, always, we only need to keep the inverse of one reference determinant. The ratio of any determinant to this one determinant is a very small, uh, the, the ter it's a determinant of a very small matrix. So we pre-calculate all the inner products between these orbitals that we need, and then we go through the list, and we evaluate these, these tiny determinants. Uh, this, this, this leads to a dramatic improvement in the, in the, in the effort, actually. Whenever you start, you start doing really, really long determinants, uh, determinant expansions, for example, this is using data from 2010, so this is actually probably even better now. Uh, even if we use uh, thousands of configuration state functions, the we get speed ups somewhere between 20 and 30, maybe maybe much more in the evaluation, uh, which makes these calculations actually quite affordable. So we don't have to pay a factor of 1,000. We only pay maybe a factor of 10 or something like that. So with this, uh, these are some applications of, of multi-determinants. Again, the idea is to add variation of freedom and use the optimization algorithm to recover better solutions out of this more flexible wave function. So for example, this, is, this was, uh, so this has been shown before, by the way. This is not the first time uh, Cyrus showed this first uh, in 2008. 
there were several papers, I think Fernando was in, in one of them for the nitrogen molecule, where you can show that if your optimization algorithm is powerful, you can keep adding determinants and recover it back uh, a good solution, I mean, th the best solution that you possibly can. So for example, for the water molecule, we have the VMC energy uh, in blue, the DMC energy in red, and a, a very good estimate of the exact answer for the water molecule. This is with an all electron calculation, by the way, no pseudopotential. And on the x-axis, we have the sum of the squares of the of the initial determinants, let me put it this way. So ha, ha, there are many, many ways to plot this in this axis. We, we, people, Cyrus and, and other people realize that using this, this sum of the squares is, is a very good uh, way of presenting this data because it's, uh, it leads to very <coughs> linear dependence when you get close to including uh, all of the determinants. So effectively, this is a measure of from whatever theory you were getting the determinants from, how many, uh, how much of the important determinants you're capturing. In the limit where this is 0 0.99, then you're capturing, according to that wave function, 99% of the important determinants. Of course, this depends on uh, this, this, the number, this value completely depends on which theory you're using to extract the, the determinants from. I should say that up to, up, to, up to now, basically, we haven't really gone beyond this, we always get the determinants, uh, the initial downscreening of the determinants from, from a quantum chemistry calculation. Uh, we haven't quite figured out a reliable way to decide which determinants completely on a QMC calculation decide which determinants are important. So there's there are methods like uh, self-healing that would do that uh, in a slightly different way, but uh, by far they, they haven't become mainstream. But certainly there are very good ideas out there based on self-healing on how to, how to choose the determinants completely from QMC and take away the, the quantum chemistry in these calculations. This is, this is roughly where, again, the research is being performed. And as you can see, uh, the improvement in the variational level is, is dramatic. I mean, and you can see on the top the number of configuration state functions that we have. By including something like, you know, a few hundred configuration state functions, we already recover basically what the DMC energy of a single determinant calculation is. The, calcul the, the expense to do this calculation is maybe a factor of four to five more expensive than doing the single determinant calculation. Depends on the details, of course. I, you can actually make it quite expensive if you want. But if you do everything perfect, it's maybe a, at worst a factor of 10, let's say. And, uh, and you are basically at the same level with a variation wave function as where you would be with a, di with a diffusion calculation with a single determinant. And you can keep going. The more determinants you include, the, the better it gets. Of course, this, you're only including, you know, at this level, 3,000 determinants, for example. So you get very close to the exact solution. Uh, this is actually better than any, before this paper, this PMC calculation is better than any DMC calculation previously reported, for example. But it's still some considerable, I mean, some what, uh, I think it's like five or six millihartree off. Uh, if you do diffusion Monte Carlo on the same, you can see that now the improvement is somewhat slower because the diffusion process is already capturing a lot of correlation down here, but it extrapolates. Uh, to, a, to, an, to a number that's actually very close to the exact value. So I think the extrapolation is one millihartree off. Uh, if I were to redo this calculation right now, using all this technology, I, I can probably get right on top of, of the calculation by, for reasons that I would explain later. For example, in terms of, uh, I, I recently mentioned, and, and I will go back very quickly, calculations on the G2 tested. These are the 555 molecules that we were discussing before. So if you do single determinant uh, calculations, you get a mean absolute error of something close to three k calls. Now, if we repeat this process, you can see that, uh, so on this axis, you have different levels of theory. And on this axis, you have the mean, uh, the mean error on the atomization energies, which is what you calculate in the, G in the G2 tested. For example, you have DMC calculations here, VMC calculations with the same uh, orbitals and determinants that you did here. You have couple cluster. This couple cluster is F12 couple cluster. So this is already with a, ex with a way of estimating the, the contribution of to the correlation from the cusp. So, so you can see that the errors are quite good. If you don't do this, and this is standard now, but two years ago it, it wasn't, for example, a few years ago, then the errors are still quite significant. So if you use a huge basis set, you can get couple cluster numbers that are very good. But even for something like a quintuple zeta, the error is still uh, quite large. I mean, large comparable to what they can do. Anyway, then you have MP2 numbers and uh, as a function of basis set and uh, some selection of DFT. 
So in this case, the DFT errors are not quite big because we're using an effective core potential, by the way. Uh, this is not an all-electron calculation. It was meant only uh, as an illustration. So if we look at the, uh, at the, C, uh, the DMC calculations, for example, what we have is different bars, each showing a different cutoff on the number of configuration, a cutoff on the, no, basi basically this is a cutoff on the value of the weight of the configuration. So when, when I get back a, a multi-determinant expansion from a quantum chemistry calculation, each determinant would have a coefficient. I look at the coefficient and I only include coefficients whose weight is above a certain number. And then I reduce this cutoff and I see how the energy converges, as, which is exactly what I'm doing here, for example. And you can see that from single, basically you can go from single determinant and systematically improve this number effectively to, any, to anywhere you want. By the time that we do this extrapolation down here and we go into the limit where we would have included all the important determinants at that particular level of theory, we have cut the error in the atomization energies to something I believe 0 0.75, 0 0.8 or something like that. And again, like I will show in a few slides, yes. Uh, well, it, it's it's mostly the, the error is, is within the error bar. Actually, I did not plot the error bar, but basically you, you don't get any improvement. Uh, with this cutoff, you typically only include a dozen or so determinants. So it, it, like you say, it's, it's a very, you can see right here, it's, it's a very small improvement. These molecules have no static correlation. So the, DF, the, the, the hard to focus determinant is the only really important one. So anything you start including from the second one on, it's at the same footing of being not quite important. So only including, for example, nine doesn't really do that much to you. So this is why if you do a very, very small uh, in, in, uh, inclusion, you basically don't get much. Okay. Uh, so uh, that follows up my question. What results, I mean, I can see why they should have a more dynamic process. Mm -hmm. So a priori, so a priori the, the only chemical intuition for the most part. So if you work on this enough, you realize that at, so at equilibrium is, is the, the, likelihood, the likelihood of a molecule having static correlation of equilibrium is small. Doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, it does happen, but it's quite small. It's whenever you start going away from optimal energy situations that, that you start developing static correlation. So Bond breaking is, is by far the prototypical scenario in molecules where static correlation appears. When you start breaking a bond, the electrons have to decide whether they want to remain in the middle between the two or they collapse back into each two of the atoms. So in the limit where you break the bond, there's still a strong interaction, but it's not anymore through over wave function overlap. It's, it's you know, uh, action at a distance. So dispersion takes over. Uh, but this regime between I'm still bonded and I'm not directly covalently bonded anymore is a big source of static correlation because now you have all sorts of states collapsing very close to each other. I forgot to say that the main source of static correlation is the generacy in near the, the homo lumo gap. So as soon as you have states that, uh, I will go back to this to try to illustrate it better. Each one of these states has uh, a, a single particle energy associated with it. So as soon as the energy of the bottom of this guy gets close to the energy of this guy, then the, multi the, the, the many body state, the slated state that you can build by in, uh, exciting the state up to here, it's very close in energy to the Hartree-Fox state. And then if you have many, many more of these up here, you start generating all of these possible slated determinants whose many body energy is quite close to the Hartree-Fox state. The real many body state would have an important contribution mostly from all of them that have the right symmetry. So the, the big source of, uh, of, the gen of uh, static correlation is the fact that you have degeneracies, close degeneracies at, at least around here. So if you think about transition methods now where you have uh, half field or, or not completely field uh, bands, for example, you can imagine that, uh, for example, in a, in, a, in a case where you have D electrons and you don't field the D band entirely, you're gonna have a large number of nearly degenerate states, which leads to all the, the strongly correlatedness uh, correlation on, on, on this series, for example. Any, is, was this a good explanation? Any other question? Okay, so we can move on. Uh, yeah. Could you please comment on uh, how to fix the cups condition with the whole electron separation? Right, okay, sure. So the question is how to fix the cusp condition. There are, there are two ways, basically. You can uh, 
So if you realize here, uh, this is the logarithmic derivative of the entire wave function. Uh, it doesn't matter as long as when two electrons get close together, as long as that derivative becomes exactly this, it doesn't matter where the uh, where it's coming from. So what, what I mean by this is that you can put, you can make the determinant satisfy the cusp, or you can make the jastro satisfy the cusp. By far the easiest way is to have the jastro satisfy the cusp. And what you do is that you make these radio functions themselves satisfy the cusp. If you write this like this and you calculate the logarithmic derivative, you can show these coefficients, for example, can ha would need to have particular values in such a way that when you calculate the logarithmic derivative of the full gesture, you get exactly when, two, when r goes to zero, exactly one fourth, exactly one half of whatever it is. Uh, there's an alternative way where you can make the gesture cuspless, meaning whenever two electrons get close together, it has a zero, a, a zero logarithmic derivative, and you can put the cusp on the determinant. To do this, you would need to modify the, the, the orbitals in such a way that they satisfy the cusp. There are some algorithms out there that would do this. Uh, Casino, for example, came up with a very nice algorithm to do this in a very generic way. What you do is you take, uh, for the electron-ion cusp condition, so electron-electron, the only way to do this is in, in the gesture, I should say, I forgot about that. Because this is the only place that depends on the distance between two electrons. Uh, between electrons and ions, for, for this particular condition, you can actually put it uh, in, the, in, the, in the determinant by making sure that your basis functions behave properly near the nucleus. So if you, if you look at the angular dependence of the radio of, of the basis functions that we have, the S function, the one that has no while m equal to one, is the only one that can possibly have a cusp. So what you do is you fix all your basis functions in such a way that instead of having Gaussian form, you sort of erase the, the Gaussian and build something that has the proper cusp, such a way that the basis themselves have uh, exact cup, cusp conditions. Or you can do this on top of the orbitals, for example. So Casino, for example, has this. Uh, this is implemented in QMC Pack. Uh, we're not going to look at this uh, in the tutorial, but if you're interested in this, let me know. There's a very simple change to the input file that would turn on this uh, cusp correction algorithm on the determinants, for example. In the cusp, they're built to satisfy the cusp, by the way. Uh, so the electron, electron, you don't have to worry about this. Uh, and what we do is uh, in, this, in the base plane conditions, we, uh, the freedom at the origin is completely determined by the cusp. We, we don't allow you to modify the wave function at the, at the origin. It's completely set by the cusp condition. So this would always satisfy this. Uh, so in this case, for example, we can show that we can improve the answer as much as we want to. So this was, uh, again, I, I keep coming back to this because this was done with a very specific choice of orbitals, if uh, th this we can improve actually these days. So we can make this m number even smaller by making slightly wiser decisions in terms of which orbitals we use. Uh, and as you can see, we are competing with the best couple cluster that, that you can do. Uh, this, the reference in this case is actually these numbers extrapolated to, to infinity. And, and you can show that the expected accuracy is, is actually very good whenever you do this. Another example, for example, from a recent paper, Ah, and I forgot to add the reference, so I, uh, if you are interested, uh, I can let you know. This came out uh, recently in JCP. It's the study of uh, the relative energies between different configurations of triradicals. So in this case, this is a benzene ring where you remove some of the hydrogen atoms, and then you're looking at different states between uh, these, uh, different spin states uh, between these. And you can show that uh, in this case, there is a lot of dynamic and static correlation. There's some static correlation, a lot of dynamic correlation in the system. So the only way to get uh, a really accurate solution, and, and this is actually very close to the best quantum chemistry you can do, uh, is, is by including enough determinants. Uh, there are two things that can happen. You can either get something like this where the accuracy at the single determinant level is not quite good, uh, or you can actually, if I were to use DFT orbitals in this case, so this is using orbitals that already have incorporated some many body character from the, from the quantum chemistry. If I were to use DFT orbitals, for example, and just do my standard prescription, take let's say PBE orbitals and stick a gastro, I would get the wrong ordering. This guy would be lower in energy than this guy, actually. So this is a case where uh, you need to go beyond the standard prescription and uh, multi-determinants allow you to do this. So we, we did many calculations and we went beyond what we actually had to just to show, but in practice, just by including a handful of determinants, you're actually doing way better than what you're doing on the single determinant case. Uh, so I, I keep going back to this. Uh, Whenever you're doing a multi-determinant calculation, you have to make two choices. The first one, the easiest one, is 
which orbital set you start from. The simplest decision is to, to take either Hartree Fock or, or any DFT, basically the same single particle orbitals that you would have used for your Slater, for your single determinant uh, wave function. But this is not the only set you can have. You can actually do, you can actually get the orbitals from a more refined quantum chemistry calculation, for example. Uh, you can do things like CASA CF. So in CASA CF, as I will show uh, in the next slide, you actually rotate the orbitals to make the, base, the orbital set the best that you can have for a given multi-determinant expansion, for a given short multi-determinant expansion. But this helps fix uh, errors in the orbitals whenever correlation is strong. Uh, or you can do something better. You can do the basis set that you get out of uh, uh, the natural orbitals, for example, out of MP2, you can, you can basically get the orbitals for something much more elaborate than Hartree Fock or DFT. Each, the, for each orbital set that you can choose, then you have to make the decision which, or which configurations I choose. Remember, we have an astronomically large number of configurations and we want nominally the best thousand to say a number. I mean, not necessarily the best. We want a thousand important ones. It doesn't have to be the best, but certainly we want to put things in there that are important. Uh, so you have to make these two choices. The first choice is easy. You just get the orbitals from some method. The second choice is you have to also decide, uh, for example, do I do, once I have my orbitals, I, I do a completely different calculation to select my, to screen my determinants. I can do configuration interaction, for example, with singles and doubles. Or I can do single, doubles, triples, and quadruples, for example. Or I can do what's called, and I would, I would explain in the next slide, second order CI, which is, uh, or multi-reference CI, which is singles and doubles, but not, not just on my Hartree Fox state, but on a whole set of determinants, and, and so forth. I, I have a, a sort of a several methods I can use, and then I, I want to see the energy would very critically depend on these two choices. Now, not critically, of course, we're getting down to the two, three, four milli error already, but uh, how close you get to the exact answer to some, to a large degree, depends on, on how you make these two choices. So. Uh, for example, this is uh, something that you would look at at the third exercise today in the afternoon, and this is again the lovely water molecule, but now with multi-determinants. And I have three, three cases here. So when I do CISD, CISD with Hartree Fock orbitals. So I, I, I do Hartree Fock and I do singles and doubles out of my Hartree Fock and I keep the Hartree Fock orbitals and choose uh, based on, the, on my typical cutoff all the configurations above a certain number. And you can, say that you can see that this is nominally, so nominally the, the type of dependence that I get. Uh, the, the exact answer is, is somewhere down here. Um, this is with the triple zeta basis set, so, so that everything can be done. Uh, so actually, we, we will only explore this site. I, I provide numbers, uh, but in, in half an hour or so, we can only really optimize uh, this side of the, of the, of the column, of the, of the figure. But basically, if you were to do the entire calculation, and I give you th these results, this is what you would roughly get. So if you do Hartree Fock orbitals with singles and doubles, eventually in this limit, you are including all the important determinants according to CISD, but with orbitals from Hartree Fock. Uh, we can do two things. We can do, for example, CAS CI, which is, uh, uh, to my knowledge, other than the work that we have done, the, all the other multi-determinant calculations in the QMC community typically come from a, from a CAS SEF calculation. And if you remember, CAS SEF is a full CI, but a very reduced number of orbitals. For the water case, you typically do all eight electrons in the water molecule in the same eight orbitals. The Hartree Fock has only four orbitals occupied. You put four extra orbitals and you do a full CI in this case. And you choose all the important determinants in this case. And as you can see, uh, I believe the single determinant results are 262, so they're somewhere up here. By including determinants in the cast, you can certainly improve somewhat the energy, but the source of determinants is so, so limited to only determinants with these four extra orbitals that even if you were to include them all, uh, it's still limited what you can get. Uh, it's still an improvement, but it's not quite. By including excitations that are much higher, even if you only have two excitations, instead of all eight excitations in the cast, you can actually recover much more. And finally, then, if we use second order CI, which it's the best we can afford at this point, and you guys can think about it and, and, and maybe come up with better methods, but as of right now, this is the best that we can do. Second order CI is uh, you take uh, your CAS wave function, all of the determinants that you can build out of exciting within these four orbitals, and you do singles and doubles of all of them. So any configuration that's in here would also be included here and some extra. And you can, and the orbitals are actually coming from 
CAS SEF calculations instead of from Hartree-Fock. And you can see that uh, the improvement, uh, the, the extrapolation to the full inclusion of determinants is actually better. And I didn't show this here, and I apologize. The number of determinants is actually smaller. So uh, for a given number of determinants, let's say we're restricted to 100 determinants, the amount of energy that you would get with the second order CI would always be way better than what you get with any of these two. Uh, it's it's no, no, it's it's huge. Uh, so, from here to here, it's it's it, it think about uh, the number of excitations you're including. So, uh, from Hartree Fock to CISD is n to the six. Uh, from CASA CF to second order CI is is nominally n to the six with a huge prefactor. So, for something like this, you can afford. I mean, this you can do in half an hour, a few hours actually with games. Uh, Eventually, so this is mostly for demonstration purposes. The whole point is we want to show that it can be done if you actually do it. If you want to do you know, a, a molecule with 30 atoms, you would not be able to afford second order CI. But the whole point and the whole challenge to the community is can you find a way to replicate what you are doing here without needing the chemistry? So this is where self-healing and some of these ideas come from. And hopefully it will come out from some, somebody in this, in this uh, room. Uh, yes, but now it's 10 to the power 6 multiplied by the number of references. So it becomes... Uh, so the combinatorial number, on, on this side it's combinatorial but with a very small m. So m of 8, for example. Uh, and then for all of those, so here you would have typically, I don't remember, 50,000 determinants or something like that. And then you would have all singles and doubles, so n square, m squared times 50,000. So the, since everything done in chemistry is kind of linear algebra, it's actually quite efficient. Uh, but still, the number is so large that you know, it's limited. But by the way, Hartree-Fock takes a few seconds. Second order CI takes you know, half an hour, something like that. Uh, and this is with a tiny basis, a triple set. You can probably not afford this. It would take weeks to run on a like in tuple set basis, for example. And to go to the dimer, forget it. Uh, so, so this is mainly for demonstration purposes, but it's really to drive the idea that Maybe you can find a better basis set, a better set of molecular orbitals directly with QMC. You don't have to use, uh, if you were to go from Hartree Fock to something better, you get a significant increase, decrease in the energy. So maybe you can do this step directly with QMC. And if you can, I would like you very much. Uh, and we would implement this right away. Anyway, uh, so this is, this is the last thing I want to say about multi determinants. You have to, in principle, the, th this is a powerful method, right? So you can, you can even if you just do Hartree Fock, and include a bunch of determinants that are nominally important, you're going to get good answers. But you can refine the answers if, if you understand what's happening. Uh, and this is, this is where we want to drive technology development, by the way. So we move on to something slightly different. Uh, I yesterday, David mentioned, uh, so now we move on from multi-slater determinants, and we go into other ways of improving the anti-symmetric part of the wave function. Uh, David, for example, talked about backflow transformations. This is something that it's actually the other way around. This is coming from physics and it's extremely foreign to chemistry. Like they, quantum chemists, I, f I find it extremely hard to explain what's happening here uh, because it's really coming from the idea of, of improving the wave function on an electron gas. So I, I, David mentioned yesterday the justification for this, so I, I'm not going to repeat it, but I'm going to remind you about it. Uh, basically, the way you derive how this comes about, how, you would, how this would be an improvement to the wave function is by looking at the electron gas. And you can use this feynman cax formula that gives you a route to improving the wave function. So if you have the wave function and you multiply it by the average of the, by the exponent of the average of the local energy, that should be a wave function that's better than the one that you had before. So if you repeat this step twice, the second time you get a form that looks uh, like this, where now the, 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 co the coordinates that go into your later determinant are not the coordinates of the atoms, but some, some dress quasi-particle coordinate that depends on what are the electrons doing around you. And then, so th th what you do is, you define this transformation in a s through some generic uh, radial dependence, uh, so through some radial basis function. 
The way that, you, that this would actually come exactly in the system would be too complicated to, to, to handle electron and elec each electron at a, t at, a while, at a time. So we just generalize this on a basis function, uh, and, and then we would expand this uh, through some radio function. Typically, we want to use Gaussians or splines. In, in the code, if you do this by default, then you just get splines. And then we, we expand this in terms of the distance of all the atoms. You calculate the quasi-particle coordinates, uh, and as I will show soon, you also need to know the gradients and the Laplacians of these uh, quasi-particle coordinates, basically. Uh, you, you need the full uh, tensor, actually, because this depends on, uh, on, uh, on component. This would be x, y, and c. And it would depend also uh, a particle, a coordinate, quasi-particle coordinate i depends on all the electrons at the same time. So you need the gradient with respect to all the electrons. So the way operationally this works, at, at this level, by the way, so the way David introduced it is very intuitive. It really depends on, on the, if you can go back to the idea of backflow 40, 50 years to Feynman, actually, and what's the influence of, uh, of the flow of particles going one way on, on, on a static object, for example. And you can show that the particles sort of curve around, fluid flow around this, this, uh, this, this, proper, this, uh, this object. So it's very intuitive. The way I see this and the way I, I, I like to talk about this is, is kind of more generic. So once you incorporate this into the wave function, I see this more as a source of variation of freedom that's particularly simple to evaluate. More freedom, more parameters, more ways to extract information out of the system through optimization. So operationally what happens now is that your Slater matrix, the one that we saw before where you have orbitals one way and electron coordinates another way, now you have orbitals one way and quasi-particle coordinates the other way. And from then on, it's just basically chain rule every time you want to do any operation on it. So the determinant, it would be exactly the same determinant that we had before, but now with this quasi-particle, the, the matrix of quasi-particle coordinates, you, what you actually need uh, is the derivative of this determinant in terms of the original coordinates, uh, the, the gradient and the Laplacian, uh, in terms of, of the original Rs. So what we actually get if we were to get ev basically just change the matrix and, and do the same technology is the gradient with respect to the quasi-particle coordinate. So you, I'm not going to go through this. I, I'm just going to show the equations. Basically, what you get is uh, you have to apply the chain rule. So you take the gradient with respect to the quasi-particle coordinate, and then the gradient of the quasi-particle coordinate with respect to the original coordinate. And then you have to construct these two tensors. Uh, so for example, this would be otherwise the gradient, for example, with respect to the quasi-particle coordinates, and then you end up with a term that gets contracted with A, which is just the coordinate of the quasi-particle with respect to the original coordinates. And for the second derivative, it gets a little bit more complicated because now you have cross terms between uh, these two things and these two things. Uh, but basically, it can be written down. It's implemented in the code. Uh, you can actually derive the gradient of these three objects with respect to variation of parameters. So all the variation of parameters are contained in the definition of this guy. As of this point, is some generic rate of function that you parameterize some way, and, and then you get the actual shape by optimizing parameters back. So you need to get the gradient of these guys. Uh, I have derived these equations analytically, and they're implemented in the code. Uh, if you want to do backflow, the, the, the reason why typically backflow is not used, because uh, evaluating the gradients numerically, people typically evaluate them numerically, and this is already uh, the complexity of this increases by an order of n compared to standard uh, slater jastrow uh, So if the evaluation of slater jastrow is uh, n squared, for example, for the, all the gradients, this would be n cubed for all the gradients due to the extra contractions that you have to do. Uh, but you can do the gradients analytically, actually, and in, in QMC pack, it's more expensive, but it's something that definitely can be done. Uh, the only thing that you have to remember, and David alluded to this, is that now every quasi-particle coordinate depends on all the electrons. So if you move a single electron, you cannot use the fast update ideas anymore because all the columns change. So nominally, you, have, you get a new, entirely new matrix with a single electron move. It would be beautiful if you guys could come up with a way to move the electrons collectively in such a way that only one quasi-particle would change. In such a way, then you can do all the very nice tricks but so far, no one has been able to, to figure how to do this in, a, in an efficient way. Uh, but that would be nice. Uh, anyway, so what you typically do is you have to do an all-electron update. So you move, if, you, if you, the expense to move one electron is the same as the expense to move them all, then you might as well move them all. And you have to move them a shorter amount of distance, but then you move them all, and then you have to update everything from scratch. Uh, so the casino group actually showed that 
moving all the electrons, even though computationally seems more appealing, it actually leads to much longer correlation because you cannot move as far because you're moving them all. So even with background, with the more expensive evaluation, it's actually more efficient to just move a single electron or maybe a very small number of electrons all in the same region at a time. Something else that we have implemented in the code that I don't believe is in anywhere else is the idea that you can use the Woodbury formula, uh, this generalized matrix lemma, to actually, if you move a quasi-particle coordinate and these guys have some finite range, not all of the electrons really get involved in the quasi-particles, not all of the quasi-particles, sorry. Only the quasi-particles whose eta has some overlap uh, with the particular electron that's moving. So all of the, basically a, a, small, a smaller number of the columns would change because this guy's finite range. So you can actually use the Woodbury formula to only update, to do a multi-column update, only taking into account the guys that have changed. And it actually leads to a quite a decent speed up. And this is already implemented. Not well documented, but implemented. So if you have questions, let me know because I, I was the one who did this. Can, can you say that again, sorry? Uh, back row measure will change the model surface, the spectral multi-determinant. So it would change in single and in multi-determinant. So what you're actually changing is a coordinate that goes into the determinant. The determinant remains the same. So if you have a, a, a set of orbitals and you're putting electrons in these orbitals, what, what change is it's what are the, the positions that you're putting into the orbitals. So it takes basically what it's doing is it's dynamically keeping electrons apart, which is what correlation wants to do. In a single determinant wave function, uh, electrons end up too close to each other because they don't really know about distance, they know about the mean field. This is a way of incorporating the fact that electrons really want to stay away from each other. So if you see what, it's hard to explain because I, there's actually no direct connection, but if you see what ends up happening, it's really through these et eta functions, you end up helping keep the electrons slightly farther apart than they want to, to be according to the single determinant and the correlation energies get get much better. You can, you can show that for the electron gas, the, the improvement is dramatic. For molecules, it's, so the variance, for example, gets improved by like a factor of two almost. So uh, a factor of two is, is, is a decent enough improvement that it helps, uh, you know, fight some of the more expense. And the accuracy, there's not that much experience, but there is a significant increase in accuracy. And as I will show next, if you combine this with multi-determinants, it actually leads to much shorter, with, uh, to the same accuracy with a lot less determinants. So this is another one of those places where I think a lot of work should be done. Uh, yes. Should, should when you optimize this backflow, yeah. you optimize the coefficient of the determinants and also the hash throw all together? So, so far we're not there yet. Uh, so the, the multi-determinant, so if you have a single determinant, then it's at the single determinant level, we can couple all the parameters, just throw backflow and everything. For multi-determinant wave functions, I am still working on this. So maybe a year from now, I have a very preliminary implementation of putting everything at the same level, but I, I don't even know if it's on the release version. It's, pro it's, def it's definitely on, on, my developmental, on the developmental side. So the idea is that very soon, yes, we would be able to do everything on the same footing. Right now, I'm not sure that this can be done. There's, I mean, there's a very rough implementation that I haven't quite tested. The other thing that, that's gonna happen and that I also implemented is you can actually do a very similar fast update with this guy because you don't, if you're doing multi-determinants, you don't want to repeat n times the same computation. You want to use the fact that you already did all the effort for one uh, Slater matrix and that the difference between this Slater matrix and that Slater matrix are, is just two columns. So you, you can use, uh, reuse a lot of the fast uh, algorithms to actually drive a, a fast version here. It's not quite as good, the improvement, but certainly it helps quite a bit. But uh, this is, again, this is not even in the developmental version, this is in my own version, and it will make it to the final version very soon. Okay, so multi-determinants plus backflow. Uh, the only multi-determinants pl plus backflow paper that exists came from the casino group. Uh, they actually have a few of them. Uh, actually, let, let me take one step back before I go there and repeat what David showed before. I, I absolutely love this figure. This is for the electron gas, and it shows how it shows several things. First, it's showing the variance as a function of the energy. So David already mentioned this. It shows how the energy and the variance in the case, at least for the electron gas, is, is there's a linear relationship between the two. You can make systematic improvements of the wave function and eventually get to the full fixed node DMC calculation. 
Uh, so for example, if you just do a single Slater, this is a, the, the simplest thing you can do, Slater gesture. You can add complication, uh, this is a two-body gesture, you can add complexity to the gesture, and you can actually use backflow uh, on top. So these two points are thin backflow and three-body uh, gesture with backflow. And you get this nice decrease in the variance and the energy in, in such a way that it nicely leads to a linear extrapolation if you were to do the full calculation. And the exact number is actually quite close to this. So ideally, this is what we want. Uh, you, you can do Slater gesture and you can do two things. You can either do multi-determinants and lie somewhere in here, or you can do backflow and backflow takes you quite far uh, without quite the expense of a big multi-determinant calculation. For molecules, this is not quite n as nice and, and linear, but the improvement in the energy is still there. Basically, the improvement in the variance is not quite, quite as straightforward, but in the energy it is. In this figure, this is coming from this paper that we wrote a couple of years ago, we have uh, three type of calculations for the energies of single atoms. And this is again just for illustration purposes. You get BMC with a single Slater Jastrow wave function, DMC with a single Slater Jastrow, and these results were taken from a paper by Toulouse and Julian Toulouse and, and Cyrus Umrigar. Uh, then you can do two things. We have uh, multi-determinant calculations with backflow, or and in this case they only use 50 configurations in the multi-determinant and they put backflow, or you can get the sort of best multi-determinant that you can choose for a given set of orbitals by doing this extrapolation. And you can see that the DMC energies from the two of them are basically on top of each other. And in both cases, we're getting above 99% of the correlation energy. So this is, this is quite good. I mean, this is as close to exact uh, as we probably want to, to get. Uh, this would be enough. Uh, and th the important thing is that in, in both cases, this is a straight up multi-determinant expansion, typically with two to 3,000 determinants. Uh, and these guys only using 50 determinants now, but with backflow. If I were to choose the, if I were to show, and it's not here, the single determinant plus backflow result with DMC, it would like somewhere down here. So, so you get a lot out of both, putting determinants and putting the backflow. So eventually where, where the coding is heading and where the field, at least for this case, is heading is to be able to use this, this type of combining backflow and multi-determinants together in large enough systems so that we can see this dramatic improvement, but we don't quite rely so much on having these very large determinant expansions. And in this case, in this figure, uh, which comes from, from the same paper where this data was taken, they just show, uh, I believe the difference between these two is uh, if they're both multi-determinant expansions with backflow, but the difference is mainly the orbitals used uh, in the multi-determinants, the basis set. So you can also, even if, if this is an, uh, basically a, an improvement of a few years in, in, the, in, the, in their decisions. And even with the same nominal answer, you can still get quite a bit of improvement and get uh, correlation energies that are basically on top of 99%. So if I were to zoom up here, basically we're somewhere very close to, to their case. Uh, so other wave functions, th there are many other things that have been tried. Uh, s typically at this level, they are quite research uh, this is at the research level, so I, I'm not going to say much about it, and we don't have that much time. Is Paul here? No. Uh, so we have three uh, from all the wave functions that have been tried, and they, they are more than this. I, I'm just showing the ones that I would consider that are particularly exciting to me, for example. And on one side, you can get actually pairing functions. This is the idea that you all the wave functions that we're building are from anti-symmetric pieces that have orbitals that only take into account a single determin a single electron at a time. No orbital takes into account the fact that two electrons can, can get close together, for example. So you can take the next step and not just do single particle orbitals, you can do two particle, two electron orbitals, and these are called geminos. Uh, well, geminos is one particular uh, way of constructing these guys. And what you, the simplest thing, you still need to anti-symmetrize because the wave function has to be change signs whenever you exchange two electrons. So you can anti, th this A is meant to be, I couldn't, anyway. So this is anti-symmetrization of, of a function that looks like this. Uh, if you just do it, this would lead to a determinant of pairing functions, for example. And so this is called the resonating valence bond. So Rela is the main proponent of this thing, and he, he does, he has a, a very long list of papers with this guy. Uh, so Mikhail Bagdish and, and Lubo Schmitas and Lukat Warner and, uh, in the North Carolina, they, they took this one step further. And instead of only coupling up and down electrons, they actually couple up and up, same spin electrons, up and down electrons, and then they also leave the chance for open shell uh, cases. And uh, this is basically, this is called a Fafian wave function, and it's a generalization of a resonating valence bonds. And what it's doing really, 
It's, this is kind of like the general, it's, it's directly related to a determinant. You, you can expand this in determinants at the end of the day. And uh, th this allows you a lot more freedom into coupling, uh, you know, different electrons in the wave function at the two electron level. So this is, this is a quite a, a big jump into, into the anti-symmetric piece. Uh, of course, this has been completely re reduced, uh, limited to the particular groups doing this development. Uh, there's a very rudimentary implementation of this guy in QMC pack, but it's, I wouldn't say really production level at this point. Uh, but, you know, there's a, a lot of work uh, can come from, from this type of expansions and it would also lead to very big improvements in accuracy. The other very uh, important idea that was recently introduced is the concept of size extensive multi-determinants. This is the idea that in principle if you just do a blind brute force multi-determinant expansion it's not going to be size extensive by what I mentioned before. Twice the system is not the same as two individual pieces but uh, Claudia Filippi and uh, her group developed this idea where you can actually do a, a, a hierarchy of determinants basically and you can make this hierarchy more complicated as your system grows. But you do it in, in a controlled way in such a way that the number of determinants that go into the system increases linearly with the system size in such a way that by the time if you double the system you have twice the determinants but you keep the description and the number of determinants consistent as the system grows. So of course this would be limited in accuracy compared to the more brute force of include as much as you can but it gives a very systematic route to including determinants in a controlled manner. So I think this is, this is a particularly nice way to, to do this. And in the, in the near future, we're going to be implementing this, this type of ideas in, in QMC pack. But for now, uh, the European version of CHAMP is the only code that has these wave functions from Claudio Filippi's group in Holland. I don't know exactly. I forgot the university, but uh, you, can, you can look it up. I want to go quickly through some applications. This is, uh, again, each application is, is, is would require too much information to describe in general. So I'm just going to go very briefly through the type of applications where QMC has been used uh, in the last few years and the things where we roughly want to go. So this, this figure, this work that we did actually came out a few months ago. Uh, I think Paul mentioned this. In the idea here is uh, we really want to study liquid water, aqueous solutions in general, things dissolved in water or pure water. Uh, this is an extremely complicated system. There is decades of work from all angles. This is probably the most study liquid in science, I would say, probably. Uh, we would love to do direct quantum calculations, uh, QMC calculations, but for to study the dynamics of liquid water takes simulations of nanoseconds almost. So definitely this is way off what we can uh, afford these days. Uh, so the idea is really to use QMC to see how accurate the other methods that are used are. And sadly the answer is that DFT is actually quite poor. Uh, I don't, I'm not gonna go into detail, but we can use QMC to see how far off the, the potential energy surface of all of these systems are. And uh, DFT is actually ex extremely poor, which couples to the fact that DFT cannot describe the anomalous properties in water. Uh, for example, ice doesn't float in water if you describe it with a poor DFT. Uh, if you do exchange, you get a big improvement, but it's still not quite right. Uh, th th there are some improvements to DFT actually that would make, that, that make the error become dramatically small. Actually, uh, submitting a paper right now where we can correct DFT and, and get the error to this level. But uh, you clearly show that, it clearly shows that you really need to do a lot to DFT to get it to work. Uh, this is, all this work is actually uh, kind of following work that Mike Gillen and Dario Alfe have, have been doing. Um, anyway, so I don't want to butcher names, so you can go to this reference. They started, they have also a big, uh, a big amount of work in water and aqueous solutions, so they, they have a lot of work comparing uh, the energies of small water clusters to really uh, almost exact couple cluster calculations and you can show that QMC in general is actually spot on. I mean the error is, is very small and the errors on the DFT are all over the place. Uh, for example, uh, Sandro Sorella has recently started working with Michele Casula and his students on the proton transfer. And this is the idea of if you put excess protons in water, uh, they, would they would disrupt the, the, the hydrogen network around it and it would change locally the properties of water. This becomes a strongly, uh, you know, much more complicated. If we cannot do, if DFT cannot do simple water without any extra, without any uh, modifications, it really does a very poor job at protons transfer, for example. And uh, for example, and finally, this is work uh, in collaboration with these guys, I believe, where they're looking at the binding energies of ice 
and this is now a solid, but it's directly relevant. And you can show that DFT is, is all over the place, but Monte Carlo is actually spot on on top of experiment. So this gives a lot of confidence to, if that to the fact that if we were to uh, study these weakly bound systems with Monte Carlo, we get really, really high accuracy. And we can use it to correct DFT, by the way. Another type of application is, is excited states. I haven't talked much about it. And I actually, we don't touch excited states much in the tutorial because this is more of an advanced method. But we can use Monte Carlo to study excited states. And if there is correlation, if correlation is important for ground state, it's actually way more important for the excited states. Uh, so there is a lot of work, mainly by Claudia Filippi uh, and her group, on the, the use of Monte Carlo not only to study the, uh, the, the energies of the excited states, but she also has a lot of technology on how to optimize geometries, for example, and optimize properties directly for the excited state. If you excite a molecule, the, the distance between the atoms is not going to be the same on the excited state. So you can actually, uh, she has, really has a lot of very interesting work uh, along these lines. So if you're interested in excited states, I would, I would strongly suggest downloading any paper that Claudia has worked, uh, that has written in the last 10 years and very carefully going through because she, by far, is, is at the edge of what QMC can be used for excited states. Uh, there's also work on, on reaction height, uh, on studying molecular reactions, for example, when you break, you have a, a molecule and you want to break it apart into, from products to reactants. The important is not just the energy before and after, but the energy as a profile of the collective variable. If you start, if the collective variable, for example, is separating them, it, so the energy as a function of this distance is very important because uh, not only the energy between the beginning and the end matters, but also what energy you need to go through the energy barrier decides how quickly a reaction happens. Uh, so this describing this, this is the, transi the transition point, basically where, where the reaction goes either way. This is typically quite strongly correlated. I mean, there's a lot of very important correlation. And mean field methods typically uh, get a very poor job at doing this barrier height. So th there is a lot of work also from uh, Claudia Filippi, in this, ca in this case with uh, Saverio Moroni and, and some other collaborators, using QMC to, to study these, these barriers. Uh, and also you can look at uh, ex more properties. So the, this is on this side work by Leonardo uh, Guidoni and I, I don't know if I'm butchering his name, and I'm sorry, this is my Guidoni or Guidoni. Uh, so he has a lot of work together with Sandro Sorella now on extending uh, the use of, now at this level, at this case, VMC, and calculating all sorts of properties from molecular systems. So he's doing, uh, he's optimizing geometries, for example, he's calculating polarizabilities, he's calculating uh, many, many more properties uh, using variation of Monte Carlo and extending the, 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 the reach of the method. In, in these sort of small molecules with strong correlation. What's next? I, from my point of view, this is a very uh, personal uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, so first of all, I put it at the bottom, but by far the most important thing is we need more applications. We need to use, mm -hmm. and the tools are developed, the tools are robust. What we really need is to, to, to increase the usage of, of the method. So I, if you guys are interested, I, I strongly encourage you to take whatever system you're working on, whatever research you have, and give it a try with Monte Carlo. And, and hopefully, as I illustrate and as I we would show through the tutorials, it's extremely easy. If you know the configuration of your molecule, you're going to go from there to a simple Slater Jastrow calculation without you know, almost no human intervention. It's actually quite simple. And uh, so, so we w the, the most important thing is really to start ex applying the method, uh, in, in of course, in problems where, where, where it, it would deem a many body application like this. And I think. Uh, Paul already ex uh, expressed some ideas about what, it, what it's a, a, an important idea, when it's a, a smart idea to apply Monte Carlo and when it's not. So from the point of view of methodological development, for those of you who are actively involved in technical details of Monte Carlo, uh, better wave functions, of course, is always going to be the most important thing. For example, in terms of wave functions, control by control MSD expansions, I mean anything that we have done so far is extremely brute force. We uh, grab the best we can from chemistry, all the configuration selection and all the orbitals are coming from chemistry calculations and we re-optimize the whole thing with QMC. What we really want are two things. One, we want to do the orbital and the configuration selection directly from QMC. If I give you a Hartree Fox set of orbitals and nothing else, can you do everything directly with QMC? This is what we're actively thinking about. And the other thing is following Philippe's work and with the interest of doing this in solids, can you come up with some hierarchy can, so can you come with some scheme where, again, you can go from DFT, like DFT orbitals to a very well-developed one-parameter knob that would 
include determinants in a solid and increase the accuracy, basically. So this is another very important uh, aspect. More estimators, so there's a lot of work, for example, like I said, forces uh, in particular, in terms of calculating more properties are the most important thing. They are uh, implemented in QMC pack. Uh, I would say that probably, again, going back to the, the work in, in Europe is probably where the forces are uh, more advanced, but uh, we're ex ex all of these things are being incorporated in, in the different codes around the world. And I would say very soon we would reach a point where we can do geometry optimization and use forces directly with QMC. Excitations also, and, and in general, anything where correlation is important is also a very important forefront. So, uh, any questions? Uh, this is the time. If not, uh, I think we're done for now and we would go on a lunch break. Uh, if you still have any questions, we can talk about it in the afternoon. Thank you.